we're here with Guillermo del Toro, the visionary writer-director of such films as Pan's Labyrinth, Hellboy, and Crimson Peak. Uh, the Shape of Water is his 10th movie and won the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival for Best Film earlier this year. We also have with us Doug Jones. Woo! He's one of the most prolific actors working in Hollywood. He's racked up over 150 TV and film credits over 30 years and has appeared in many of Del Toro's films. In The Shape of Water, he portrays a character known as the asset. Let's hear it for those guys. So Guillermo, this film uh, blends so many different genres. There's fantasy, there's period drama. There, it's a monster movie, it's a romance, it's an espionage thriller. There are even elements of old-fashioned movie musicals. Where did you come up with this idea? Um, may, maybe you can take us through what inspired uh, this film and um, what is essentially, spoiler alert, an interspecies love story. Well, what, what is beautiful is it's even beyond that because for me the creature is not a real creature, is not an animal, it's, you know, it's, it's a primordial and elemental god of the river. So it's not so much a, a, a love story uh, as it is a story about love. It's about loving uh, friendships, marriages. And the, every character has a love story in the film that resolves in the course of the film in one way or another. And that's what makes it very human, very emotional for me. And, uh, you know, what I do, I don't know what I do. I've been doing this for 25 years. So whatever fruit I give, it, you can say it's a pear or a pineapple. Whatever it is, that's what I do. So at this point, it's, it's like, okay, you know, you know what you're getting into. I'm not a brand, but I'm an acquired taste. <laughs> you know? So, you know, you know what you're going to get. What is beautiful about The Shape of Water <clears throat> is that it's, Sort of three movies in my life have been, have come to me at really, really, really low points in my life where I, and they have saved my, I wouldn't say sanity, but my life I'm breathing, you know? And one was Devil's Backbone, mm -hmm. which came after, uh, I think, yeah, no, yeah. After, after a catastrophic experience with uh, Mimic at Miramax Dimension, which is still the worst experience I've ever had, you know? Uh, the, the second one was Pants and Abbott. Which, uh, which, came, uh, which came at a point where I was questioning so many, many things. Uh, partially also, what, what we do, what we live behind, who are we, blah, blah, blah. And this is the third time. And it came at a moment of great darkness, and it came from the most genuine place. And uh, a mentor in Mexico, one of the filmmakers I admired the most, uh, he saw it and he said, you finally exhaled. Mm. And I agree. It is, it is the first time, my movies have been, you know, like, full of loss and, and, and nostalgia, and, and they, were, they had a little bit of that tension, and this is the first time, you know, I let go. I would say I let my God out, but I've been doing that <laughs> for many years. But, but you fi I find that there's, a, there's an encompassing humanity and a, and a different, and part of it is, it's a love letter to love, and it's a love letter to cinema. Mm -hmm. Because I do believe a film has a different power than any other audiovisual narrative form. And, and because it's so intoxicated with cinema, it is everything, and it's a very difficult movie to deliver. A very difficult movie that required every ounce of skill and every ounce of love and effort to, to be delivered. Um, now, there's a character in the film that Doug portrays, and he's known as the Asset. He's an amphibian humanoid. And uh, you are certainly no stranger to putting monsters in your movies, but yours have more metaphorical weight than most movie monsters. What do monsters mean to you, and what do they represent in your films? Well, to me, uh, see, when I was uh, a kid, a very, very young kid, I, you know, Mexico, Mexico has... Uh, when, when, we when we collided with uh, the Spanish uh, Catholic religion, we did a thing called syncretism, which means we fused our old gods with the new. And we made our mythology as um, indigenous tribes sort of conflate with the new Catholic religion. Right. That happened to me with monsters 
on the Catholic religion. It really, it really, I've said this before, some people found Jesus on the road to Damascus, I found the creature of Frankenstein. Right. And they, they became a spiritual and, and, and representations of spiritual virtues, of concepts, and my spiritual cosmology is made of these creatures. Mm -hmm. So they don't, they don't represent what they represent to a normal person. I am an abnormal bastard. <laughs> and, and, and they really move me in a spiritual way. And, and in this case, uh, the beauty of this character is that uh, it has a power uh, and a beauty to it, but uh, it represents the other. Because we live in a time where we demonize the other. We, we are told we got to fear it. We, ideologies are telling us everywhere, constantly, why we have to uh, divide the world in us and them, whether it's uh, race, religion, geographical provenance, sexual preference, gender, uh, anything uh, creates these fake divisions of us and them, and there's only us. There's only us. There's, there's not them. Them is a concept that's created to control us, to make us afraid of each other, and the movie tries to embody that concept of the other in, the, in this creature. The beauty of the other, you know? Right, you know because, you know, what makes us different is what makes us great. And, and it's sort of beauty and the beast in, in a way that it shows you that beauty doesn't have to be a perfect princess. She doesn't. She doesn't have to look like a perfume commercial model. She has to be, she can be a full of quirks and supposedly defects that are her virtues. And the beast doesn't need to transform to be loved. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it doesn't have to turn into a boring fucking prince <laughs> to be loved. And, 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 and or renounce to the essence of who it is, you know? Uh, because to me, love is not transformation. Love is acceptance and understanding, you know? And, and, and so it's a very different version of a tale like that. It's a fairy tale for troubled times, I say. <laughs> yeah, you know? There you go. Um, that's very well said. Now, the, the, the princess in this fairy tale is played by uh, Sally Hawkins. Uh, she portrays a character named Elisa, who is a mute uh, cleaning woman at a secret governmental facility. Uh, and I understand that you wrote that part for Sally. Yeah. She delivers such a powerful performance, which is about 99% wordless, yeah. and she's just luminous in this role. Uh, what made her write for Elisa, and what had you seen her in that, that made you want to cast her in that part? You know, well, uh, I think she's one of the most amazing actresses working today. Uh, the first time I saw her, I saw her in a beautiful BBC series called Fingersmith, and she uh, is a Victorian story of crime, and she falls in love with another woman, and the way that she made that just an integral part of the character, there was no perverse, prurient element. It was just, they're in love. And she loves this woman, that's it. I thought it was so beautiful, so natural, so of a piece with who she was. There was no titillation, no angle, no indication. It was just, that's, that's reality. This is who she is. And I thought, what a powerful uh, way to interpret you know, uh, this character. And then I saw her in Happy Go Lucky, mm -hmm. saw her in Submarine, and I saw her look and listen, she was in the background and came and back and forth. And I, most people think an actor is, uh, 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 delivers great lines with great aplomb. An actor listens mm -hmm. and an actor looks and an actor is there. And Sally does all those things. And this character, I was important. The two main characters, I brought this since the beginning. If you saw Kronos, one of the two main characters says one word in the whole movie. In Pacific Rim, the two main characters are the ones that speak the least lines of dialogue in the movie. Charlie Day gets a hundred lines more than Charlie Hunnam, you know? <laughs> and, and it's something I, I go towards more and more in the movies. In, in Devil's Backbone, the main kid doesn't speak much. The girl in Pan's Labyrinth, the same. And here, the two main characters don't talk. And part of it was because love renders you speechless, number one. It, and you cannot talk about, li, words lie, looks don't, energy don't. And I wanted that love to not be sweet talking, but to recognize the essence of each other in a powerful way, you know? 
So nonetheless, you have to come up to Sally and say, I've written this great part for you. You just don't get to say anything for the duration of the movie. <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, many, uh, the movie started cracking into position uh, in 2011, 2012. We were designing the creature, the world in 2012, 2013. And we presented it to Searchlight in 2014 with the full realized visuals and uh, the, the beat sheet, uh, many pages of the script, blah, blah, blah. And early on, I sent a message to Sally's agent. I'm writing a movie for her. I wanted to tell her. And then uh, when I met her for the first time, <laughs> it was Alfonso and Alejandro uh, called me. I was watching Antiques Roadshow in my house. <laughs> and I was lazing, you know, blobbing out in the sofa. And Al Alfonso calls and says, dude, come over to the party, the Golden Globes party. I said, I, I'm not going. You know, he says, I'm watching a big show show. He says, I said, look, we're going to get drunk. I go, I don't drink. I said, yeah, yeah, I, we know, but, you know, how many times are we going to get together and, you know, we can really have a celebratory. And I'll, I, if I'm going to drink, I don't want to drive. They say, we'll send you a car. <laughs> uh, I go, send me a car. They transport me all the way from where I live, which is 45 minutes, 15 minutes from L.A. I get there. I arrive and I say, Look, because I'm fat, I, my body mass requires enormous amounts of alcohol <laughs> to, to, even, to even get buzzed. And, and I get sober super fast and I don't get hangovers. So I recommend you all get fat. <laughs> you know? and, and so I arrive and I say, we're going to drink. Yes, OK, I'm going to start. And I drank 14 shots of tequila really quick. And 14. I, I'm 14. And I get, I get a little boss. <laughs> and, and I go, okay, guys, let's catch up. And, I, and, I lose it. and they say, we changed our mind. We have, you know, we're not going to drink. I go, <laughs> so I'm leaving the, the party and I see Sally. First time I see her, I say, Sally, you hear more? And I hug her and I go, I'm writing a movie for you where you fall in love with a fish man. <laughs> And she says, great. You know? yeah. so that was the first meeting. <laughs> and, 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 and she says, and this is beautiful, she says, I'm writing, right now I'm writing a story about a woman that turns into a fish. And I said, can you send me your writing? She sent it. I incorporated ideas of hers into the screenplay. Oh, wow. It's really beautiful. Wow, that's amazing. Serendipity. Yeah. Um, uh, from what I know, you lavished attention on creating the fish man. Yeah. Um, and he has to be believable as this otherworldly being that's actually worshipped as a god where he comes from. But he also has to be a viable romantic lead. Yeah. And he's a sexy fish man. I mean, the critics all agree he's a sexy fish man, Doug. Um, so, so take me through the process of, of coming up with Fishman. I understand it took three years well, of development overall. Three years to design and execute the creature. Uh, Dog was blessed with no shoulders and no ass. <laughs> so, so we can build up whatever we want, you know? Dog is like a wire armature, you know? With a sense of humor, you know? <laughs> so what, what we did is we sculpted the perfect swimmer body, and then the face millimetrically we would move the eyes, make the, the lips a little la wider, a little narrower, a little wider. You know, it, 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 we spent many, many uh, sessions sculpting, re-sculpting, repainting, painting. Uh, I've been tweeting a couple of images, but uh, an art of book is coming out that details it a little more, but it, it's really impossible to... One day I would love to do one of these and we just talk about designing monsters or designing creatures, because it's a whole science and a whole art. But I've been doing it for 25 years, right? Mm -hmm. And I knew, I said, I, I want to create the Michelangelo's David of amphibian men. Mm. You know, absolutely beautiful. And then you sculpt that. Imagine this. This creature needs to be vulnerable, fierce, divine, like a god, regal, uh, ferocious, sad, vulnerable, all this. And you have to sculpt a lot of that and paint a lot of that so dog has instruments. And then he is the, an, the anime, the, the animation. He's the soul of this, of this creature. And without him, there would be no. And then you ha add another element, which is if Sally doesn't look at it and loves it, mm -hmm. it never comes alive. Mm -hmm. 
And I must say, Sally had a massive crush on the creature. <laughs> <laughs> wow, a little method acting there. Yeah. Um, so the character also recalls the creature from the Black Lagoon, as well as Abe Sapien from the Hellboy films. But he's very, very different from them. Yes. Um, but I mean, there are those deliberate references. So can you talk about sort of grouping in what it was, we... It was actually the opposite. I said to the designers, these are the only two creatures that we can reference. Right. I said, if they come through the same process, any detail, good. But uh, you know, when you think of Abe, if you grab Abe and put him in shape of water, it wouldn't work. No. Mm -hmm. His primary colors, super slender lines, like automotive lines, he's a comic book character. And the performance is, of course, completely different. The only detail that I liked was the eggs, which I put into the movie. They were not in the comic. And it's, the eggs mean a very different thing in this movie. When you see it, it becomes a symbol of something else. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, what, I, what I, I said, the creature looked, the Gilman is going to, we all know it. It's like we're designing a giant gorilla. You don't have to say King Kong. It's going to be, it's going to be already sort of immersed in the DNA. So we, we went at it, and the creature needed to have majesty. That's the thing that it needed to, to have. And I have, the, the, let me explain. When you design visually a movie, imagine a bullseye of circles, and the center of the bullseye is the creature. It's like when you buy a pet, you buy a terrarium, you put sand, a depressing little palm tree, a little water, for the creature to live there. Well, the, the way you design a movie is, all the colors of the film are in the creature already. And you design the wardrobe, the sets, the color, the cinematography, everything to accommodate that creature. You take that creature, you put it on a realistic movie, photograph realistically with realistic wardrobe, realistic, it doesn't work. So yeah. the entire movie is, a, a, is an ecosystem to sustain the creature. People yeah. think it's separate things, they're not. It's a single, uh, it's a single exercise. Wow. Mm. Um, right? Makes sense. Oh. Del Toro. Um, Doug, you've appeared as outlandish creatures in several of uh, Guillermo's movies. And now. weddings. <laughs> <laughs> in Bar Mitzvahs. Right, yeah. <laughs> I have. I have. Um, oh. Kids so tell me if I have this right. Six movies, you've portrayed 12 different characters in these films, uh, among them Pan's yeah. Labyrinth, Hell Hellboy, and Crimson Peak. Mm -hmm. Take us through Guillermo contacting you for this part and how he explained what he wanted out of your performance as uh, Amphibian Man. Yeah, first of all, it's hard to talk after him because I could listen to you all day. I have you listened to you all day, but, 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 I, but, I, love, but I, I love it. Um, uh, uh, but we were working on Crimson Peak at the time. It was, it was January of 2014. I had a day off from filming, and, uh, and his office called to say, can you meet uh, Guillermo at his office for lunchtime? I thought I was in trouble. So I go into the principal's office. I come into his office. Dougie, shut the door. Oh, crap. I am in trouble. Um, and uh, that's when he told me that the next movie he wanted to make after Crimson Peak was this one, The Shape of Water. And, uh, and um, he mentioned that there's a creature in it. Uh, it's, a, it's another amphibious water creature. And he wanted me to play him. And he said, and the reason I wanted to call you in early was because uh, I know you're a good Catholic boy, and there's a love element to this that, that might get a little, you know. Physical love. <laughs> physical love element, yeah. And, and I get it on. Right, 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 right. So, I, so with, with this happening, I was like, well, what, are we going at it doggy style? And he, he said, doggy. No. Uh, doggy style, yeah. Okay. <laughs> doggy Jones. Yeah. So... So uh, uh, he said, no, well, no, it's in a bathtub. OK, well, all right. So le let me uh, tell me the story from the beginning and get us to the tub. And, and so then he verbally, he didn't have a script written yet uh, that I knew of anyway. And he starts just verbally telling me it was story time with Guillermo, which you know how much we love this, right? <laughs> so chin in hands, I'm listening to him ta tell me the whole story. I wanted a campfire lit, and I wanted marshmallows, and just keep talking, you know? Uh, this beautiful story is unfolding in front of me. And, and this innocence and this, this connection of two souls is happening. And by the time we got to that bathtub, uh, I, was, I was like, I'm in, I'm in, <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, yeah, and I don't think that the Bible has a... Uh, <laughs> a, a, a yeah, thou shall not cover your thy fish. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. And a fish is a Christian symbol, so... Yeah, that's, right, that's right, that's exactly right. Uh, yeah, no, but animals, in, animals from the wild don't have to get married first, I found oh, yeah. out. Yeah. But what sort of trepidation did you feel 
this being, I think, your first romantic lead in literally yeah. scores of films. That was the, what made this one different, yeah. Uh, and uh, having played 12 creatures specifically for Guillermo, um, this one being, uh, when, he, when he, and he kept stressing, you're the romantic leading male of this movie. Uh, and, and he, Dougie, you're the romantic leading male of this movie. I had to be reminded of that several times because I'm, I'm used to being, you know, a character that adds some color, pushes other people's stories along something. And uh, this, this was, uh, to be put at the centerpiece uh, with, a, with a romantic connection was, was a, a challenge and, a, uh, and I was terrified. I was terrified going in. And, but what, what helped that a lot is that we were called in to rehearse early. Uh, we filmed in Toronto and, and uh, Sally was brought in much earlier than me even But because uh, she had an awful lot to do. She had to learn uh, you know, to tap dance. She had to learn how to uh, uh, sign language. And, and uh, so we, we had ballroom a... Ballroom dancing. Ballroom dancing, right. So we... We, uh, we had a specific scene uh, that we had to choreograph and, and work through, so I was brought in for rehearsal for that with choreographer Roberto Campanella, beautiful, beautiful uh, work he does. During that three-week rehearsal period, though, is when Sally and I got to know each other at a personal level, too. Well, we're, we're learning a specific routine, but in the meantime, we're also chatting and laughing together and even crying together at times. and, and uh, uh, we're sharing secrets and insecurities with each other, and I'm a, I'm terrified of this movie. Are you too? Yes, I'm me too. So, it's that kind of healthy fear that 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 made us uh, bring our bring our A games, hopefully. And um, so during that getting to know each other, we, by the time we the cameras rolled on us, we had a very intimate, uh, affectionate relationship with each other. I. I love that woman dearly, and she's unlike any actress I've ever, ever worked for with in my life. Before the camera rolled, almost every take, almost every scene we did, uh, we were petting each other's faces, we were hugging each other, we were caressing, we were holding hands and saying, I love you, no, I love you more, no, I love you more, no, you can't love me more because I love you more. You know, we were having that conversation <laughs> almost every day, and that, that was very comforting. You don't know that to me. I mean, no, but I do love you more, <laughs> but I do. <laughs> So technical question, how much time did it take to get into that suit and go through makeup every day? Mercifully short for this kind of a, of a head-to-toe transformation. It was only about three hours. Uh, that's only, only, yeah. No, no. Uh, that's, that's little. That is little. And the thing is, uh, the emphasis on this is we wanted to create a beautiful physical uh, mm -hmm. makeup and effect and suit. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to go CG. We wanted to yeah. use little details of CG to do micro-expressions on the face, which is beautiful. You'll see it on a clip that's coming. The micro expressions on the face are pushed. But what we did is we faded the model in and out digital. So you go back to the physical model mm -hmm. almost immediately. And you ret retro project the plate. So it's this exact same surface, same glistening, everything. It's a very beautiful process. Mm, yeah. Um, you've done so many projects requir requiring prosthetics and intricate costuming. What are the challenges of acting while wearing all that? Oh, everything that you think it would be. It's a little bit hotter than you want. It's a little bit heavier than you want. I can't see very well. I can't hear very well. I, you I, cannot poop? I couldn't poop. <laughs> <laughs> this design had or a... peep. Well, right. <laughs> I, I, well, in this case, I, I had you know, uh, webbed fingers that were glued on and attached to these arms. So I was glued into the, these hands all day. And I couldn't manipulate a phone. I couldn't manipulate my own business, uh, right? So, and I had a, uh, in, the, in this suit design, because that, that ass was so yummy, <laughs> best ass I've ever had. I, <laughs> unfortunately, I had to give it back every day, but uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's kind of wet. Um, but, <laughs> but. From the water. From the water. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but, but with that design, uh, it would have ruined it to have a trap door built in. So, so I had to take, it's, it's a, this is a young man's game, and I'm 57, come on. Uh, but, but it was, uh, I had to... 57? I, but, right? Bad. Don't I look amazing? <laughs> uh, so, uh, it, yeah, those challenges... 53! Are... Yeah! Yeah, you look amazing! <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, so you know, it, it's uh, it, those challenges are, are a part of, of wearing wearing rubber from head to toe. 
Okay, I'm gonna come straight out and ask you for the secret sauce here. Uh-oh. Um, what's the trick to conveying that this fish man- He couldn't release man... it, the secret right. sauce. <laughs> <laughs> we just covered this. <laughs> um, what's the trick to conveying that this fish man is capable of romance? He's an animal, mm -hmm. but how do you make him sexy? Right, right. Well, again, this design he just told you about, uh, when I put that body on and looked at it for the first time, I was like, damn. <laughs> you know, right, yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, that didn't hurt anything, um, and uh, uh, but honestly, it was that heart and soul connection with Sally Hawkins on film. I believe that's what really sells it. I, uh, uh, some some physical direction that Guillermo gave me was he said, "I want you to channel a little bit of the Silver Surfer, which I'd played in a previous movie." Uh, For one reason, because uh, you know most people think, "Oh, it's a comic book character." And the Silver Surfer is a god. He's a god, yeah. right? So the the this I. This is a, a, a creature that is a god mm -hmm. of the river. It's not a, a real animal. It's, a, it's an entity. It's a, it's a primal force. And if I may say this, mm -hmm. uh, each of those uh, suits and makeup bring a posture. Like when you put a uniform, you stand differently. Right. This, these things do the same to the actor. Right. And when I, played, when I did play the Silver Surfer, that was the most regal and, and, and most power I'd ever had in a character before. So he, he knew that, he, he put that back in, in my, into my system. Mm -hmm. And he also said, I want you to sprinkle a little, a little bit of matador, you know, a toreador in there. So who, it's a very sexy sport. Uh, they lead with the pelvis. And, um, and so every, he said, so that meant I, when I'm standing out of water, never to be straight up and down, always to have a bit of a curve, a bit of a, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's a, you know, uh, Gil, Kin, Gil Kinney, uh, the animator, calls it twist and turn. Just in no, you, you're never, I mean, when I do it, I look like a, like a Botero <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. version of it, but it's, you're never, you're always pointing, the upper body is pointing slightly off to the lower body, right. and you lead with the pelvis. It's a, it's a very heroic, yeah. very powerful posing. And that, that, that also helps inform you know, who I am and, and, and how I'm to be. Um, so, so we, so we fell, so <laughs> Sally fell in love with me. There, boom. Yeah. <laughs> um, Guillermo. Not you, the suit. <laughs> it was the uniform, man. Yeah, when I took it off. <laughs> oh, wow. It was the uniform. <laughs> Don't make a mistake. <laughs> Guillermo, Doug has appeared in six of your films, um, starting with 1997's Mimic. Yeah. Um, in the past, you've praised uh, his discipline. Can you talk a little bit about that and what distinguishes Doug as a performer? Well, you know, as we age, I get more empathic. With Doug, like when we were both young, I didn't care. <laughs> and I'm like, let him suffer for his for his check. I'm suffering over here. As we get, as, and like in this movie, the first the yeah. first sequence, the first thing we we shot, it was a torturous, brutal sequence for the character and for Doug. And mm. you know, I, I really, I think even he can see that I have a human soul. Yes. And I was really very moved by his plight, Doug has bled for his craft, literally on, on Hellboy 2, when he performed the Angel of, of Death. Mm. We created these incredible mechanical wings that people go, oh, it's CG. No, it's not CG. Yeah. It's real wings, real blinking mechanisms, but they waited, basically, the, the, they waited as much as a Vespa on your back. <laughs> and, and there was one or two little metal pieces that, God forbid, why we didn't, they, they were not completely filed and they dug into Doug. And I say, Doug, how are you feeling? He says, well, I'm bleeding, <laughs> but otherwise I'm okay. Uh, and we removed the, the wings, and the next day we, we assisted him with a, a, little with wire. a wire. Yeah. On the, but, but I've seen him, I, I would see Doug just quietly bleeding. Hmm. That's discipline, man. That's like, I think he's some kind of monk or a samurai or a, <laughs> you know, that has that discipline. For the craft, and I think uh, that's admirable. Not everyone can. And by the way, a great actor on makeup sometimes cannot make this makeup work. Right. There are many examples. I won't quote them out of respect, but then you have guys that have that gift. He has the gift. Ron Perlman has the gift. Yeah. You know, he can make. That's the only other time I've sculpted or designed a leading band for a movie. Hellboy was took the same amount three years mm -hmm. to make both of them. Three years to make. When we were talking in the green room, uh, you said something, Doug, to me that I thought was extremely interesting, which is that until Pan's Labyrinth, um, 
maybe the entertainment industry thought of you more as a performer or a model rather than an actor, and then that was the film that suddenly made everyone wake up to realize that you are indeed acting and yeah. you know, doing things that are relatable on a, on a human level. And Guillermo, I mean, it seems like after six films together, he's almost sort of like a good luck charm uh, or, or something. I'm fast overstating things. Him or me? <laughs> <laughs> him, him for you. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I mean, you know, you, when you are a storyteller, you curate a family mm -hmm. through your life, you know? And his family. He's the undernourished cousin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Cousin Jebediah. <laughs> yeah, I, I have often said that, that Guillermo, Guillermo's mind is a house full of creepy crawly monsters, and I have had the privilege of being many of them, and I get to sleep at the foot of his bed. Mm. That's how I feel. That's a great one. I'm going to be scary tonight. I'm yeah. scared right now. Oh, no. Is you awake? Is he there? Yeah. Is he there? <laughs> Flashlight. <laughs> so, so, so far we've talked about the pleasant experiences of putting this movie together, but I've heard that you described The Shape of Water as a terrible filmmaking experience, oh, yeah. and that mainly had to do with the budget. So can you talk a bit about what made this so tough to physically shoot? Well, the movie is incredibly, was incredibly difficult to shoot. It was a very, very demanding shoot. We were all suffering. Uh, and, but it was great creatively. From the first day to the last day, creatively, amazing. But it was incredibly difficult because this movie, which when you see it, you saw it, it looks like it cost 67, 70 million, you know, it's a huge. And we did it for 19.5. Mm -hmm. And as of this week, we're, we're under, under uh, more than $100,000. So we finished under budget. Mm -hmm. And to do that, and everything right. went yeah, that doesn't happen. Yeah. And I did it because uh, when I did Crimson Peak for 55, I obligated the studio by that number to try to sell it to the wider audience possible, and they had to sell it like a horror movie. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. It was a gothic romance. And, you know, when you buy a Gucci bag to collect the leaves on the lawn, <laughs> it's still, well, this doesn't fit too many bags. No, sir, it's a Gucci bag. No, you sold me. This, uh, sold it as something that is not. Yeah. It's very frustrating for me to try to say, it's a Gucci bag. <laughs> but it's one of my favorite films I've done, and, yeah. and I, I really thought, I don't want to go through that experience. How much can we do it for? And a budget is a state of mind. It really is. You can make, and the scope of the movie was done with blood, sweat, and tears. Every day there was something that we were struggling to get, but the job of a director is to make sure you don't leave without the goods, mm -hmm. you know? It's like, it's like the Sally Field movie, not without my take. You, know, <laughs> like, you, you needed to leave with the take you wanted, exactly as you wanted it, that's your job. Mm -hmm. And you don't leave the day without the scene, you know? But from what I understand, you did something very, very clever, like you did a sort of Roger Corman uh, move in that I read that you piggybacked the shooting on the series that you do for FX, The, the Strain. Strain. Yeah. You know, is that right? Yeah, we did, we did something very, very clever and something very, very stupid. I, <laughs> I, put, I put all my salary into the movie as producer, writer, director, because I knew uh, I was going to need it. I said that from the start, I said, I'm going to put my salary. I want, because I'm a collector, I collect art. Well, I'm collecting this. This is part of my collection. I want this to exist in the world. Mm -hmm. So the money is secondary in that sense. Uh, my agent is not happy. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> but I am. And the thing, then we did something very smart. What we did is Miles Dale, my producer and I, we said, let's uh, roll the crew and the uh, studio space of the strain straight into the production, and we shoot between seasons. Mm -hmm. So we have a very definite window, the only window we could shoot the movie in, uh, right when the, it was ramping down the strain and right before the next season was starting up. And that made us, gave us a lot of, uh, a lot of leeway with that, you know? And I think it's smart to do it. Mm -hmm. Smart to do those type of things because they're invisible and they end up in the screen, the value. Mm -hmm. Which is all the more uh, amazing when you consider that this is a this is a period film. Yes, this film is set uh, within the tumultuous culture of the Cold War in the 1960s. 
Um, and I, I, from what I know, that was a very, very specific choice that you made to set it during that time. What, what was it about that time that helps the story that you wanted to tell? Well, the movie is about today. It's about everything that we're dealing with today. Uh, the toxic, toxic division of the ideology, us and them and all that, that we discussed. And 1962 occupies a very important place in, American imagine, in the American imagination. It's the time where it's as close as we get to the American fairy tale. Mm. Kennedy's in the White House. Uh, there's post-World War II abundance. Uh, suburban wealth, uh, cars in every garage, TV, media starts shaping the identity of America. Uh, uh, movies are dying, TV is racing, uh, painted advertisement is dying, photography is racing. There's a lot of things, and, and, and yet there is a Cold War, and uh, it's a perfect setting for a love story. That. Mm. And at the same time, everything that looks fantastic, which I think is embedded in the American dream that time when, when you think about America being great, you go to the Madison Avenue design of that 1962 America mm -hmm. before Kennedy gets shot, before Vietnam escalates, you know, fully. And, and, and yet, if you see that time, there was gender discrimination, uh, there was race uh, discrimination, there was violence, there was Vietnam, there was all these things mm -hmm. underneath that smiling facade of a barbecue in the suburbs, and it's today. It's, it's very, very connected to today. Now, if I talk about it, and if I set the movie in today, what happens is what happens in conversations right now. We are beyond words right now. We are beyond truth. An argument can be made very smart, very cynically, about both sides really quickly and disarticulate the dialogue. But if I tell you, once upon a time in 1962, mm -hmm in a country not far away, <laughs> there was a woman. Then the movie, it's a fairy tale for troubled times. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. lower your guard and you accept to discuss with me what makes us human, what makes us connect, without the guard of, of reality, but the, with, the rea with the authenticity of a fairy tale. Because fairy tales are not realistic, but they're authentic. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. I had a question about the color, the color, the color scheme of the film, because a lot of it is the, the green that we saw in this scene is uh, appears throughout the movie, yeah. um, and I wondered how that scene sets and how that sort of provides a context for the shape of water. Well, it was very important. This, uh, contrary to most designs of amphibian men, for example, the the base of the creature is complete black, different shades of black, and then the color is there, blah blah. But all the colors of the movie are in, in it. Mm. The golden, the cyan, the blue, the black, it's all contained within the creature. And then you codify the movie according to that. The cyans and the blues are for her apartment mm -hmm. only. And uh, that we created her apartment to feel underwater mm -hmm. and like a fish tank in a way. Uh, she shares a window with her neighbor but the other, the, half of the window is in her apartment, the other in the apartment of the neighbor. And yet the neighbor's apartment is all in gold mm -hmm. and warm. And, and, and every character that breathes air, Octavia Spencer, Strickland, who's the antagonist, the, they're all in golden mm -hmm. and oranges and yellows and completely sunlight, not water. And uh, then uh, we coded the red for movies and love. Mm -hmm. You know, and you see it appear in the movie very carefully, only in those instances, cinema and love, which are indistinguishable for me. Right. And then green is the future. The lab is green, uh, the wardrobe in the lab is green, the, the Cadillac that appears is green, the prepackaged gelatin that appears in the movie is green, the horrible franchise key lime pies are green. Yeah. You know, everything that is modern appears green. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, you're using colors to tell the story, and you color code it very carefully. I wanted to double back to the notion of otherness that you were talking about earlier in our mm -hmm. conversation, because in this movie, the straight white guys are the bad guys. Yeah. And the heroes are a woman with a disability, her African-American coworker, uh, her gay neighbor, and a fish man. So, and a Russian spy. And, yeah, and a Russian yeah, spy, yeah, of yeah. course, of course. 
Um, I mean, how does this notion of otherness speak to the present day that we live in? Well, look, there are two things that worry me. One is, our discourse is becoming uh, really, really incredibly uh, violent. Uh, and, and we are demanding, uh, we see everything politically, religiously, in every instance, we, we're, we're guided to see it black and white. So while we're killing each other, the 1% is fucking us, you know? But that's the, that's the technique, basically, you know? And if you see the world in black and white, I have news for you. The only place where we can exist and breathe, the only place with oxygen, is gray. We're all gray. None of us is black or white. None of us can be defined by one or two or three words or a term or an action. We're polychrome. We're multicolored, multifaceted. Why do we need to hate or absolutely adore each other? The, the thing is, we, we, we put things on a pedestal. It's perfect, or it's the worst. <laughs> There's nothing in the middle. Eh, it's perfect, but, or it's the worst, but, you know, we, we, we're, we're losing that qualifier, and the, and the movie tries to embody the fact that imperfection is desirable. Mm -hmm. You know, it's part of who we are. Out of our defects come our virtues, you know? And I think uh, in this otherness, I believe that if you take the two most opposite people on earth and you put them in a desert island for the reminder of their lives, they will learn to love each other. They will learn to see what, what they have that they should cherish. Because it's not the natural discourse. Mm -hmm. It's a social discourse. Ideologies are used to control us. And what I'm trying to show in the movie is that you, every day you choose between fear and love. And you know, when we talk in these times, if I'm cynical, I sound super smart. If I tell you, Chris, I don't believe in love. You go, what a sophisticated man. <laughs> you know? If I tell you, Chris, I believe in love. You go, what a sap. Mm -hmm. And it's impossible for me to imagine any other force in the universe in which uh, Buddha, Christ, and the Beatles agreed upon, <laughs> you know? So should, we should listen. It's, you know, sometimes that solution is the solution. Mm -hmm. And you know what? The other word for love, which I mentioned early, the other word for love is understanding. Mm -hmm. Because if you understand, you forgive. If you understand, you love. I know this sounds basic. It sounds like a fortune cookie thing, but it's real. It's real. And if, if we are to survive as a species into the 21st century's end, we need to learn this. Mm -hmm. I think this is, a, this, is why, this is why the movie felt urgent. This is why the movie tries to be that fairy tale for this. And, you know, the easiest thing is to be cynical, sound smart, or be cynical and dislike uh, the possibility of love. But when you fall in love, which most people have at one time or another, requited or unrequited, when you fall in love and you receive love for no matter how briefly a time you do, nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. Nothing else matters. You don't need anything else. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I posit that we can do it. Mm -hmm. I have faith. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's beautiful. Um, <laughs> Not you and I. <laughs> um, you know, these two disparate beings come together and consummate that love in the scene that I think people are talking the most about out of the film festivals in which The, the Shape of Water has aired. And that's the love scene that takes place uh, in an apartment bathroom that has been flooded all the way up to the ceilings by, by the characters opening the taps of the, of the bathtub. And which the is sink. autobiographical. <laughs> no, no, that's a good story. Yeah, yeah. and I, 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 uh, people say, oh, that's not possible. I did it. <laughs> I did it, and not, not with a whole room, but I did it with a huge shower in my parents. Uh, we, uh, you know, I, 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 we had no, no bathtub, and I wanted to float, so we had a glass shower, and I put towels at the bottom, towels on the side, and it filled up to here, but the shower opened inside, and I'm alone in the house. Oh my God. So all of a sudden, I cannot open the door, and it's like an Indiana Jones dead <laughs> trap. <laughs> so, Growing, and, I, and I finally pull the glass door off its hinges, and the water rushes all out, inundates the bathroom, the corridor. And my father was not happy when no. he came out. <laughs> no, but you know, the beauty of that scene, and you've seen it, mm -hmm. is so 
beautiful. It's so magical. It's so, it's so not without any perverse, prurient. It's just so gorgeous. And you feel, it's almost like a ballet of beauty. And it's, I think that it informs the spirit of the movie. You know, it, it, it tells you, the movie tells you any form of love that is not dominant is allowed and beautiful and should be. You know, because when, when people talk about a perverse uh, feeling in any, uh, in any arena of the human endeavor, you know, it, perverse is only perverse when there's perverse intention. In a Victorian movie, in a Victorian tale, seeing an ankle is far more perverse than a catalog of positions in the rest of the world yeah. if it's done out of love and out of consent and out of uh, as an expression. And I think the moment that we're talking about is almost abstract. It's one of the most beautiful cinematic moments I've ever shot. And it's gentle and it's poetic and it has that breath uh, that I think it, it, people are taken by that because it's, it's such a gentle spirit the movie has. You know, it's, a, it's a deeply romantic scene, but I imagine, Doug, it couldn't have been easy to film because oh, you no. and Sally had to be underwater and probably come to the surface for breaths in between shooting. We did, yeah. Uh, we also uh, we went through some, some scuba training, too, just in, just in case they wanted to keep us down if the water was going to be deep enough that we should stay down and get regulators to breathe between takes and that kind of thing. So we were tr trained and ready for that. Uh, but eight feet of water, we found, oh, we can just get to the top and kind of go, <gasps> and, <laughs> and plunge down. And then we had speakers underwater so we could hear Guillermo give us action and, and uh, cut cues. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> that must be us. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, yeah, yeah, it was a matter of, and of exhaling too, because we were on the floor of the bathroom. The water's up here, so to keep lungs full of air, we would have gone. <laughs> so it was, it was a matter of uh, depleting exhaling, your, exhaling, and and uh, and uh, and trusting that that uh, that you could get through the take that way. And uh, uh, but I found that the whole the whole floating, being in real water. We, we did some scenes as well. Um, dry for wet, where Sally and I were suspended on wires with, with uh, hip harnesses, and that also had its own beauty to it, uh, uh, and he would ha put fans on, uh, on Sally to make her clothes uh, fluff and make her hair kind of go, um, and then add a water effect in later with some CG enhancement, I'm sure, uh, but, but being in, in real water was, was, was a treat, really. Uh, I, I was terrified at the beginning, I'd never been in a, in a monster costume submerged in water before. And it was one of the first images right. that we designed early on 2013. Right. Mm. So, uh, so, but, but uh, the beauty of it all. And, and a moment like that, too, th to find the romance of it, it, it was very innocent. And that's why, going back to that first conversation we had when he was concerned about, about how I would feel about doing a love scene like that, um, it had such an innocence to it and a purity. And, and the fact that these two characters are falling in love without one verbal, verbal piece of dialogue ever spoken we connected on, uh, on uh, a level of, of a tilt of the head, a look in the eyes, um, sharing, sharing eggs together, sharing lunchtime, sharing music together with her. Uh, she brings a record player into to the lab and, and, and plays me music, and that's something I've never heard before. Um, and touch. Touch doesn't lie. Uh, words, words can be polluted, but, but touch is very pure. Uh, so our love came from all of that. Uh, so, so the bathroom scene was just a, a culmination of all of the above. And then you have what the movie is, what the movie tries to do is, which is very Mexican, is to, to marry the extraordinary and the ordinary. Mm. You know, because there is a beautiful conversation the next day between Sally and her best friend about how, how was it? How'd it go? <laughs> and that I won't spoil, but yeah. you have to see it. It's a beautiful scene. It is. It's a great yeah. scene. Yeah. Um, in the green room, we were talking uh, about how Guillermo could never have made this film at another point in his career. And, and Doug, you've worked with him for so many years now. Maybe you can tell, tell us a bit about how his process has changed over the years, like how he's matured as a filmmaker and maybe what distinguishes him from other filmmakers that you've worked with. Well, uh, he's my favorite director I've ever worked with, and that will remain until the day I die. And every, every other director knows that they're Which fine. Which can be any time you just say anything wrong. <laughs> <I know. laughs> it could be minutes from now, for all I know. Minutes from now. Uh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. There's a staircase. Right. On the right of the 
<laughs> okay, I'm taking the elevator. Okay, uh, so, um, but we we met we met in a twenty. <laughs> We met 20 Your death years. is funny to me. That, why is that? Why is that? Yeah. Uh, what a way to go, though. Right. All <laughs> right. Right. Um, I was. Uh, uh, we, we met 20 years ago uh, uh, on uh, Mimic, 1997, um, and um, that was his first American studio film. I'm not wrong about that, right? Oh no, <laughs> you're not wrong. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so. As a, as a filmmaker, you know, he, what impressed me most about him was uh, when we finally talked during the three days that I was on that movie, um, I saw an eight-year-old fanboy behind those, those blue eyes of his uh, who was just excited and, and wanted to know all about the creepy crawling monsters I've played in my life before that, what makeup artists that I work with, all that. Uh, he's never lost the eight-year-old fanboy within him. Uh, success, art, uh, critical acclaim. None of that has changed uh, the man he is. And that's what I love about him the most, is that he, he's remained a fanboy who, who knows how to make a geekgasm for all of us because he's having the same geekgasm as he makes the movies that he makes. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, the, the only thing that might have changed maybe is, is that studios trust him. <laughs> they'll, back, they'll give him his budget and they'll back off now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I, love, I love that freedom that he's given because when he's allowed to make the art that, that is within him for all of us, um, that, that's when that's when the critical acclaim comes and happens, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Guillermo, you've called The Shape of Water your most personal movie. In what ways are you most personally invested in it? You know, uh, it's, it's very hard for me to say it in any other way, but uh, this movie is a healing movie for me. You know, I, I, I've, I've been remiss if I went into many details, I know, but uh, to me, it was a, you know, uh, uh, let me put it this way. When I, uh, at age 52 or 51, whenever we started, I said, what am I going to do different? You know what, I'm going to do the same movie. Because for me, what has changed through the years is the depth of what I feel about my craft and what I feel about my stories. And of course, they were always very serious for me. But I, I found that some of them connect at a, very deep level with some audiences that, that I really cherish. And they, in doing that, they connect with me. It's like, a, you know, it's a full circle. Mm -hmm. And this movie felt urgent for me. Mm -hmm. And for many, many reasons. And, and I expressed some of them. But I also said, I'm going to do something different. I'm not going to do the same thing. I'm not going to work the same way. And I've talked, for nine movies, I've rephrased the fears of my childhood, the dreams of my childhood. And this is the first time I speak as an adult mm. about something that worries me as an adult. Mm. I speak about trust, otherness, sex, love, where we're going. You know, these are not concerns that I had when I was nine or seven. You know, these are concerns I have as an adult. And... I think that it, there, the movie is at the same time very much a synthesis of what I do mm -hmm. and completely different. Mm -hmm. I think you, you find it when you see it. There's that exhala exhalation. Yeah. yeah. Um, really, one of my last questions is, I understand that you're going to take a sabbatical from filmmaking now. Why now and what are you planning on doing? Well, I, you know, my sabbatical means I'm going to produce three series for Netflix, one live action series. <laughs> two live-action movies, and co-write a book with Chuck Hogan. So that's my sabbatical. <laughs> what, I, what I meant by it is I'm, I'm going to take a break from last September to next September as director because, um, I, you know, what has become evident to me at the age I'm at is that we trade our life. We, the exchange rate is this, one IMDb entry for three years of your life. Mm -hmm. You know, and the exchange rate takes a toll. And I want to live. I want to live a little. I want to be able to enjoy this movie and the people it connects with. I want to travel with it. I want to see, uh, see it play in different cinemas, in different places. Truly, truly enjoy it. Let it sit down. And then that will inform what I do next, which can be a gigantic movie or a small movie. I have no idea. But it's great not to have an idea. You know, because... 
I feel that the 25 years I've been doing this all led to this movie. Mm. You know, everything I've done, everything I've ever been, as Sally says in the movie, took me right there into Shape of Water. Mm. And a beautiful movie it is. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Guillermo del Toro. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>